Good evening and welcome to a joint meeting of the City Council and School Committee uh, called by myself, Mayor David Narkowitz, um, in accordance with Northampton Charter Section 7-2 um, as part of our annual budget policy. Um, begin the meeting tonight by asking the Executive Assistant to the City Council to call the roll of the joint meeting. Sure. Councilor Bidwell. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Dwight. I'm here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. Councilor O'Donnell. Not present. Councilor Shera. Here. Um, Ms. Burnham. Present. Ms. Dusansky. Present. Ms. Fallon. Present. Ms. Hennessy. Present. Mr. Kaufman. Present. Mr. Meyer. Mr. Moore. Here. Ms. Uh, Ritt. Yes. Um, Ms. Boss. Present. And Mr. Zakowski. Present. Excellent. So thank you very much. Uh, we definitely have a quorum. I also wanted to note the presence of my colleagues from uh, Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School. Uh, the chair of our, our board, Michael Kaling, as well as Dr. Andy Lincoln-Hoker, who's the superintendent of Smith Vocational. Um, they are actually our other uh, school committee. Um, and uh, one of the things I'm going to ask the, uh, the uh, Charter Review Committee is to address that issue uh, possibly in the charter, because they uh, should probably be part, more formally part of this meeting as the other local district. So, um, so uh, I'll ask uh, the clerk to just pull up the opening slide. Um, I do want to say that um, those of you who've um, endured this presentation, uh, uh, Mayor may be happy to know that I've done a lot of work this year to actually shorten it, uh, to compress it. Um, you've seen it, uh, if you've seen it for many, many years, um, we do a lot of comparison slides to our compar uh, comparative communities, um, and um, we can provide those kinds of comparisons at a later date, but I really wanted to focus on, obviously, the key question, which is um, the outlook for the FY 2020 budget, but I wanted to do so specifically um, in the context of the city's uh, fiscal stability plan, which we've been operating under uh, since fiscal year 2014. I wonder, uh, would it be a problem if the lights were turned down? Because I think it would be hard to, hard, you know, it's hard for me to see. And Thank you, Maureen. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Voss. So, um, so uh, we're going to um, go through it, and I'll obviously can stop for questions along the way, but we should have lots of time at the end for questions. So I'll ask for the first slide. So. Uh, just to relive the history, the original fiscal stability plan happened in the spring of 2013. Um, in uh, 2013, we were trying to prepare for the FY14 budget. Um, at that time, we were facing about a $1.4 million operating deficit uh, that was going to require significant cuts to uh, school and city, including uh, layoffs in both city and schools, uh, uh, school and uh, public safety and other departments. Um, so we basically went to the taxpayers of the city. Uh, we developed a multi-year fiscal stability plan that in conjunction with a $2.5 million override would allow us to have to stabilize the budget, uh, fill the gap in 20, uh, FY 2014, um, but then give us some stability over the next four fiscal years. And that original plan called for um, us basically setting aside the override revenues that we didn't use to fill the gap in 2014. Um, and again, we I mentioned we had a uh, about a $1.4 million gap. We had a, the voters voted to approve a $2.5 million override. Um, and we put, uh, we voted, put that in to fill the gap in the city. Um, but we also, we didn't put it all in there. We put about 1.7 of it. The rest of it we banked into the, um, into the fiscal stability stabilization fund, which we set up. And the way the plan was set to function is that um, we would 
uh, we would use that infusion of, of new revenues uh, to stabilize the budget. It would allow us to have reasonable uh, budget increases over the next several years. Each year we would use some of the new revenue, but we would also bank some of the new revenue. Um, so we would build up the fiscal stability uh, stabilization fund. Um, and then essentially that would get us, at the time we thought it would get us through 14, 15, and 16. Um, and then we would have to tap into uh, the, the built up funds to be able to get through uh, the 2018 budget, um, which is what you see in blue. Um, and then by 2018, we, will, we would have depleted all those funds um, and we'd be back to talking about either cuts or, or uh, potentially another override. So that's sort of the background of where we came. And so if you go to the next slide, I can talk about so sort of how we came uh, to where we are today. So uh, that was the theory at the time, um, but in practice the plan has actually allowed us to experience six years of fiscal stability from 14 um, right up to the current uh, fiscal year 2019 budget. Um, and there's reasons for that, which I'll try to review with you tonight. Three that we sort of highlighted that we want to talk about. Um, certainly key was greater than anticipated new growth uh, from building activity um, in the city. That means new buildings, uh, new, uh, new taxable uh, growth. Um, we had a surge in building permits. Uh, I guess that correlates with all the new building um, and motor vehicle excise revenues exceeding projections. Um, we also had some small uh, but unanticipated gains in state aid, uh, shocking as that may be. Um, and now we'll drill down a little bit further to explain why we think, why those things change. But just again, to show you on the right hand side, that's how the stability plan has actually played out. Um, we, we were able to bank fiscal stability funds. Um, it wasn't until the current fiscal year, FY 2019, that for the first time we actually had to tap into them uh, to balance the budget, about $277,000. So uh, we thought we would need to do it um, a couple fiscal years earlier, uh, but now I'll go through some of the reasons why we've been able to extend that. So if you can go to the next slide, Laura. So new growth. Uh, when we put together the plan, obviously we were coming out of a recession, uh, which was part of the reason why we and the state and the federal government were in such difficult economic times. So we made projections uh, based on the five-year averages of, uh, of new growth. So on the left, uh, you can kind of see the new growth averages, the prior uh, fiscal years. Uh, which were FY 2009 through FY 2013, and we were averaging about $524,734 in new growth. Um, uh, moving to the right, um, the red is what we projected uh, based on those uh, previous numbers, and then the green above is actually what, what actually played out during those years. Um, and new growth, for those of you uh, watching at home who may not understand what that means, new growth is key because in addition to the level <coughs> limit that cities and towns must stay under, um, new growth gets added to the levy limit. So it basically allows you to raise additional tax revenue revenue um, above and beyond the proposition two and a half limit. Um, so you can see Northampton experienced some significant new growth during that period. Uh, again, we were coming out of a period of aver averaging about 524,000 and we had years of 916, 938. It dipped back down into 733 and then again back up over 900. So that new growth meant new revenue uh, that could fund the city budget um, and again stave off our need to use the fiscal stability fund. Next slide. Motor vehicle excise and building permit revenue. So again, these are just two economically sensitive uh, revenue uh, metrics, but not insignificant. Uh, motor vehicle excise tax averaged 2.15 million over the five years FY 2009 to FY 2013. Uh, we used a projection of 2.2 million in, those, in that first analysis, again, trying to be, uh, trying to be responsible. Um, and then you can sort of see uh, the green line on the left um, that the, the actual revenues came in significantly higher 
higher, uh, 2.6, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 2.9. So again, um, additional revenue that we were able to uh, pay for city and school services without having to tap into the uh, stability fund. On the right are building permit revenues. We were averaging about $520,000 a year in the prior uh, five years. Um, so we were using uh, about 525 per year based on that past performance. Um, due to the economic strength of our economy, we, we ended up seeing much higher numbers, 587, 661, 758. Uh, in FY 2018, it was 875. Again, that ties to all the new building construction at Village Hill, King Street, um, other parts of the city uh, where we had a lot of new, uh, new construction going on. So those are two factors. Next slide. Small gains in state aid. Um, so again, coming out of the five-year period uh, uh, prior to the um, prior to the override, you know, we were going through a period where we, in many cases, had level-funded uh, local aid and bare minimum Chapter 70 dollars. Um, we were fairly conservative in our estimates, um, uh, but. Uh, so using about 1% per year based on the prior year's growth. Um, uh, and so um, what a couple of things changes, uh, Governor Baker's administration, I give him credit for this, um, they made a commitment to um, tying the growth of local government aid or unrestricted general government aid uh, to the increases in tax revenue. So we went from 1% increases to 3.39% uh, um, increases, which equals about $130,000 uh, per year over that five-year period. Um, there obviously were decreases in offsets, but the net overall increase in state aid uh, compared with the original plan was 844,592, or about 169,000 more per year. Again. Keeping that in the context of a you know uh, nine hundred you know nine hundred plus million dollar budget, so uh, not nine hundred. Um, uh, sorry, I'm spacing out there. Um, hundred million dollar, hundred eleven million dollar budget, ninety six million dollar general fund budget. So, next next slide. Health insurance. Uh, this I talked about a little bit in the current year budget message. Um, health insurance is one of our largest uh, budgetary items. Um, uh, in the current uh, uh, fiscal year, it's over 10% of our of our general fund budget. Um, health insurance costs were growing uh, at a rate of about 3.2% a year in those years leading up to the um, override. Uh, one of the key things we did in FY 2014, and I, I talked about this in the um, in this year's budget message, uh, we did adopt the um, health insurance reform law uh, that allowed us to work with with our employee unions to move the city into the Group Insurance Commission, or the GIC, uh, which is the state insurance pool. And so uh, when you take a look at what we had projected in terms of growth, our health insurance costs uh, grew at an average between 2014 to 2018 of just 1.37% after joining the, the GIC, uh, rather than the 3% that we had that we had laid out in that original plan based on uh, based on past increases. So, so that's a significant savings um, on the health insurance side. Again, allowing us to put that revenue, uh, you know, not having to spend that money, <coughs> being able to put it into city and school services and not have to tap into uh, the fiscal stability fund. So, those are some of the factors. Also during this period of fiscal stability, um, we've, we've been able to do a number of things uh, over this period. And you can turn to the next slide, Laura. We've been able to maintain city and school staffing. Uh, that was one of the key things um, for those of you who are either on the city council or on the school committee um, in the years leading up to uh, this uh, particular uh, stability plan, we typically spent the budget process deciding what we would cut each year. Uh, we would be facing level funding, usually for all departments. Uh, mayors would have to tell the city and school that we have to level fund. Um, uh, and uh, school committees and would spend their time and department heads would spend their time figuring out what they could cut 
um, to get to level because every year <coughs> our expenses go up, our fixed costs go up, um, and if revenues and state aid don't maintain that. So it's really allowed us to um, <coughs> not have to face these kinds of layoffs and to really focus on how do we maintain and strengthen uh, the good city services and school services that we have. Um, we've also been able to rebuild and grow our reserves uh, for financial flexibility, that not just the, the st uh, stability fund, but also our free cash um, and our capital stabilization and our general stabilization. Our bond rating has been upgraded um, during that period. So again, when we started this process, we had an A plus uh, stable rating uh, in FY 2013. We were upgraded to AAA in FY 2016 and been able to maintain that uh, through the present. Very critical in terms of our ability to borrow and bond uh, for city and school projects at a much more favorable rate, which means lower debt, debt service, which means, uh, again, uh, more general fund dollars that can be devoted to uh, paying for services. We've been able to fund important capital needs. We've really um, uh, gone through, uh, in FY13, the year that I, um, my first year in office, uh, the prior year the city hadn't done a capital program because we had no money to do one. We were, we, we had no money to do it. So uh, we really had to rebuild the capital uh, program, which is vital uh, because if you do not maintain your buildings, if you do not maintain your infrastructure, um, if you do not maintain your vehicles and upgrade them, it's inevitably going to cost you uh, more uh, either to maintain them or to replace them down the road. We've also invested in parks, in open space, in rail trails, in affordable housing, in renewable energy, in bike share, in climate resiliency, in regeneration, and a number of other uh, important projects um, that having that budget stability have allowed us uh, to focus on. Um, we've also maintained a competitive tax rate, uh, $17.37 uh, uh, per thousand in the current fiscal year, uh, which is key uh, not only in terms of uh, economic development and making us attractive, but also our commitment to making sure that we don't price um, our residents out of Northampton because of uh, property taxes. So if you go to the next slide, I'll just quickly focus on the tax rate. Uh, this is just a quick comparator of, um, of our tax rate. Uh, these are the comparison communities we use in Western Mass. Um, the left-hand slide is our commercial tax rate um, in, in yellow. Uh, the residential tax rate, uh, the $17.37, um, is shown in the middle slide. You can see we're sort of below average uh, amongst our Western Mask uh, cohort per thousand. Um, but when you look at average single-family tax bill uh, for 2019, you'll see that the state average is $6,085 a year. We're below, just below that at $5,399, and you can see see in that uh, category, we're third behind Longmeadow and Amherst in terms of our uh, tax rate. Um, Longmeadow, I would add, has the highest residential tax rate in the Commonwealth, so they're kind of a real outlier. Um, but uh, that's uh, what, our, what we've been able to do in terms of uh, maintaining uh, a competitive um, and affordable tax rate. If you go to the next slide, just zoom in a little bit on the new growth issue. Hmm. Not sure where. Uh huh. Can you go back? Can you go back one? Huh. Okay. All right. Well, pretend there's a slide there. Um, well, I'll just describe it to you, and you'll have to look at it later. Um, uh, it was just basically a slide showing uh, where we fit in new growth. Really fascinating when you look at those comparator communities over FY 2015 to 2019, and you actually add up the cumulative. Uh, value of the new growth, um, Northampton has the most new growth over that period in terms of cumulative value, uh, $275 million in new growth, and that's ahead of West Springfield, Chicopee, Westfield, and all the other uh, communities. Though when you switch it over to looking at it as applied to a levy limit, um, some of those other communities raise more revenue because they have much higher tax rates. But it's fascinating to me, and, and we don't have Springfield on there because we don't really compare ourselves to the, to the third largest city, and they probably have had some significant growth over the last couple of years. But um, it's a sign of, of Northampton's economic strength um, that, that, a, that a big part of uh, new growth in the valley, at least, is happening in Northampton. So that's the slide you would have seen, so take my word for it. Um, uh, next, this is just a quick depiction of the reserves that I talked about. 
Um, the, red, uh, the red is stabilization, the yellow is capital stabilization, and the blue is the fiscal stability fund. Um, you can see that we've been able to build those back up again, uh, both for emergencies, for capital projects. We do draw from the capital stabilization fund uh, to fund capital projects. And then, of course, we've got the fiscal stability fund, which we've tried not to touch um, over time. I always have to point out, if you look at where we were in FY12 and FY13, um, you know, we were, uh, you know, had a couple hundred thousand dollars um, in reserve uh, uh, during FY12. Um, again, with a hundred million dollar budget, that was our emergency fund. Um, and again, it was because of the fiscal circumstances and the fact that the economy had crashed and local aid had been cut. Um, but uh, and that's, you know, again, played a significant role in how we've been able to stabilize and uh, restore our, uh, our bond rating and get it up to the top bond rating available. Next slide. We've also made significant progress, as I said, investing in our infrastructure, in our facilities, um, in our vehicles, and in our equipment. Uh, this is a breakdown of the investments we've made. Um, you can see starting below uh, $2 million in 2014, up to a high of almost $7 million in 2018, um, and then you know coming back down a little bit um, in 2019. Um, the dark uh, blue is the school department. Uh, we've made significant investments investments, particularly in technology, um, in our technology infrastructure, buildings, roofs, equipment. Um, the red are city departments, a combination of city departments. Yellow is public works. Uh, blue is Forbes Library. The light blue at the top is Forbes Library. We've made some investments at Forbes Library as well. So that shows what we've been doing to rebuild our capital program. Again going from FY12 uh, and 13 where we didn't, well, FY12 at least, where we didn't have a capital program. Next slide, please. Part of those capital investments have been in transportation infrastructure. We've made a significant in, uh, investment um, in things like uh, repaving our streets, uh, in, uh, in our stormwater infrastructure, um, in bridges, in pothole repairs, in sidewalks, traffic calming. These are all broken down by color coding. Um, the, largest, uh, the largest is, of course, uh, street resurfacing, which we've made a major effort, particularly over the last several years, uh, to be able to buy bond um, and, and leverage uh, Chapter 90 monies, I would point out that that static blue line at the bottom is the state's Chapter 90 money. So that's the Chapter 90 contribution from the state, which is from our gas taxes. Um, and except for that one little blip, uh, which was right after uh, Governor Baker uh, got elected and uh, fulfilled a campaign promise that he would release uh, an extra 500000 um, he has filed year after year a $200 million Chapter 90, which is the monies from our gas tax uh, that we pay. And it's the monies we use to pay for infrastructure and um, I was, I was uh, not pleased but not shocked that when he announced his new budget, he also announced that he would be filing a $200 million Chapter 90 bill. So that's one of the things we really want to focus on uh, with our legislators because um, this is money that every city and town could use immediately, um, not only to, to repair our transportation infrastructure, um, but to put people to work, to create you know, jobs and really spur the economy. Um, so Chapter 90, um, and again, take pressure off of having to fund those infrastructure needs with property tax, um, which is a, obviously a more regressive way. So that's our transportation investments that we've been able to do during this period of stability. Next slide. So a key aspect, speaking of state government, of the fiscal stability plan was stabilizing city finances <coughs> while lobbying gov the governor and legislature to address some of the key structural state funding issues. And if you read through all, any of the budget messages <coughs> over the last period, I've, I've always devoted time to many of these issues. So education funding. You know, we're still waiting for reforms to the Chapter fun 70 funding formula to take into account the real costs of special education, health insurance, 
insurance, et cetera, um, in the foundation formula budget. Um, I put a little hashtag FBRC in there. Um, and there's obviously a concerted effort right now, the Mass Teachers Association, uh, working with school committees and uh, superintendents and, uh, and other interest and parents around the state uh, to try to do the Fund Our Future campaign, which is to try to uh, once and for all get the FBRC uh, recommendations uh, implemented, which you know, conservatively estimate we're underfunding uh, or under, un es underestimating the cost by anywhere between one to two billion dollars in um, in Chapter 70, uh, or at least the foundation formula on which Chapter 70 is based. Charter school funding. We're still waiting for full funding of charter school tuition mitigation, as per the state formula, which they are not. Uh, fully funding. It's supposed to be a, a five-year uh, formula. They've never even fully f uh, funded the first year of it um, at any time. We're obviously also waiting for a revision of the overall flawed charter school funding model. Um, in past years, I've shown you the, the impact of charter school, the growing uh, curve in terms of the amount of money we lose in tuition each year. Um, and, and that seems to continue. Um, chapter 90, which I just mentioned, I won't belabor it, but again, still waiting for those increases in Chapter 90. Progressive income tax reforms. Obviously, when we talk about having to fund things on local property taxes, which are regressive, um, one way to be able to provide more funding for these critical programs is through the income tax and by making the income tax more progressive. Unfortunately, many of you know and supported the uh, Fair Share Amendment, which was an effort to do that. Um, it got shot down by the SJC. Um, and so we go back to the drawing board in trying to uh, create more revenue. Whenever I am in a room with legislators or at a meeting with legislators, I, including as recently as a couple of weeks ago up at GCC with, uh, with Senator Comerford and, and state officials, I always like to point out that every time they don't raise taxes or don't raise new revenue, um, don't kid themselves that they're not raising taxes because actually they are because their, their residents and constituents are having to pay more taxes at the local level in property taxes. So property taxes are having to go up. Um, and you know we've done historical data in past budget message that really just shows the cost shift that has occurred over the last 20 years from state funding of services and a share of state aid in, in municipal budgets and how how it has shrunk every year, which means we've had to put more and more onto property tax. And finally, local control. We're still waiting for more local control. It was funny to read um, you know, my budget message from that override year where we're basically I was saying like we've adopted the hotel tax, we've adopted the meals tax, we've adopted CPA, we've adopted everything you've given us. Like you've gotta, if you're not willing to do this, give us more tools, we'll do it. Um, and that includes things like economic development reforms like liquor licenses. Um, so if we want to spur more economic development, we shouldn't have to go on bended knee to the, uh, legislate, uh, to the legislature um, to request more liquor licenses when we should make that a local decision and we should be able to control our own economic destiny. So um, giving us more uh, local option taxes um, would, be, uh, would be excellent. Speaking of which, um, we did get two new local option taxes. You can uh, you can change to the next slide, which I hope it appears. Um, so we do have two new long-awaited local option taxes. Um, first, obviously, is the adult use marijuana local option tax. And then recently, at the end of the legislative session, um, the legislature and governor adopted a short-term rental uh, bill, which includes a local option tax for Airbnb. Um, we automatically are opted into it because we have adopted the local option hotel motel tax. Um, my two my two big complaints are um, they should have done this a lot sooner. Um, obviously, the voters passed the adult use marijuana uh, law um, a couple years ago now and was supposed to have been implemented January 1st um, of this year. Um, it then got kicked to July 1st. Um, they got a, a six-month extension. And then, obviously, as we know, uh, the first uh, retail sale did not happen until November 20th. <coughs> very end of the calendar year. So we still do not have any actual revenue from the, um, from the uh, marijuana local option tax. Uh, the timing of it and the way that it's collected at the point of sale and the way that it then has to be reported and transmitted uh, to uh, DOR, there's always a couple of month lag.
lag for those lo local option taxes. So we'll know um, end of March, beginning of April, what our, at least what our first quarter, which again is really just going to be the end of November, uh, December, and January, uh, what those numbers will look like. I caution people that those were um, extraordinary times. For a big part of that, we were one of only two uh, retailers that were open, so I think those numbers are going to be a little bit outsized, but we are going to be working uh, with um, uh, uh, working to try to develop some potential estimates of what that revenue could look like on an annual basis. It's just challenging not having any um, not having any track record and not knowing how this economy, this new economy, is going to shake out. Also, not knowing what other uh, stores may open in the city, um, as well as stores in neighboring cities. The uh, short-term rental uh, tax um, cannot take an effect until July 1st. So the earliest we would see revenue for that is literally beginning of July 1st. Again, uh, we're trying to make some estimates uh, based on uh, data that's available about how many Airbnb users there are in Northampton um, and in the city. Um, we don't know how the new law will affect that because the new law requires people to register with the Department of Revenue. Um, uh, and so that may impact uh, the number of people that are airbnb um, And then also there's exemptions for people uh, who don't Airbnb for more than 14 days a year, um, so they wouldn't pay the tax. So there's going to be a little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, work to try to understand uh, what that may look like. But those are two new local option taxes that will definitely provide us with some new revenue, which again is revenue we don't have to rely on our uh, property tax is to try to raise. Next slide. So, um, Governor Baker's uh, budget, which I referred to, I know this is small, you don't really have to see it, it's more just a visual. Um, it's, it's red, it's the cherry sheet. Uh, Susan put those two cherries up there uh, to remind me it's the cherry sheet. Um, I was actually looking for a slot machine that had like, a cherry and a lemon, uh, you know, uh, since uh, that's kind of what I think of the governor's uh, budget in terms of uh, how it works out. Um, so basically, Governor Baker's proposed budget, when it's applied to our cherry sheet, the budget that he just proposed, when you add up all of the new revenues and the new charges, we would receive $160,954 less in revenue uh, for FY20 than we did in FY19. Um, and so again, looking at things like, you know, uh, charter school, couple that I'd call out, charter school tuition re reimbursement going down 121,393. So we're going to get less, uh, less than the less than we're supposed to get. Um, but then when you jump down to the charges, you'll see that sending tuition is going up 187,611 um, with no measurable difference in the number of students. I mean, the number of students hasn't changed, but we're getting less reimbursement and our tuition charges um, are going up. And again, a lot of that has to do with uh, the formula and the way it's calculated. Um, and, uh, and these are the kinds of things that we have to um, try to address. In terms of other uh, things on there, you see chapter 70, um, when you, uh, when you cost out his proposal, uh, we would receive in new Chapter 70 education aid um, $56,120. Um, uh, I'm not sure what a percentage of but your budget that is. It's a there's a lot of zeros. There's a lot of zeros, point and a lot of zeros uh, before you get to it. But that's what his Chapter 70 uh, proposal would yield us. Now he has said that he wanted to not, uh, you know, fund Chapter 70 reform in the budget, which is to me a little odd since it's a major budgetary item. Uh, but that he would be introducing a separate. Um, education bill to try to address the foundation budget uh, matter, but of course, unfortunately, the way I read that is that you know that bill won't get taken up until the 20 budget's done, um, which means probably nothing in the 20 budget. So I'm very hopeful that uh, that our senators and our representatives will uh, really try to force this issue as part of the Fund Our Future campaign. Those of you who've attended the Fund Our Future uh, meetings, um, MTA has helpfully uh, taken the, the uh, the Foundation Budget Review Committee uh, recommendations um, and monetize what it could mean in terms of new revenue to cities and towns if we were getting the funding that we needed. Uh, 
Chapter 70 for Northampton would increase $850,000. Um, so that's $850,000 uh, that would be available for education funding that wouldn't have to be paid for uh, under either with override revenues or new override revenues. So that would be significant. So we are hopeful that that will happen. Obviously, this is the governor's budget. Um, we still have the House budget, and the Senate budget, and then obviously whatever the um, whatever the conference committee can agree to and get the governor to sign. Um, but not an auspicious start in terms of us looking at our budget um, to try to figure out what new state revenue um, we would have to work with. FY 2020 budget factors, uh, next slide please. These are just some of the things we know uh, now and some of the things we don't know that we'll be working on, but these are some of the key factors uh, that we'll be looking at. I've already mentioned the uh, local option taxes for uh, marijuana and Airbnb. So those are, some potent those are some new revenues that we need to try to uh, come up with and refine a number to build into the budget. Um, obviously, when you're trying to put a revenue into a budget, um, if you uh, uh, if you overestimate and you you know put too much revenue and you don't raise that revenue, uh, then you end up with a deficit um, in your budget and have to make cuts, etc. So we want to be accurate, conservative, um, but obviously we want to make sure that we can capture as much of that potential uh, new revenue as possible. Um, we also have some anticipated revenue from two uh, new solar uh, projects where we've, um, the council gave me authority uh, to negotiate payment in lieu of tax agreements with. Um, uh, and so those could potentially bring us some additional revenue. Um, uh, again, you know, on the on the order of a hundred thousand plus uh, for both projects combined. Again, um, we say to be determined because those projects are still in development um, and they don't actually generate any pilot revenue until they get built. So whether they happen in 2020 remains to be seen. Um, I know that in Councillor Labarge's ward, the, the project with the um, combined marijuana growing facility, solar field, and open space seems to be moving forward. Um, so hopefully that major solar field will get built and we would realize some uh, pilot revenue from that. Employee health insurance, another big wild card. Um, we, again, we go through the joint uh, the, uh, the, um, the GIC, and so um, we are waiting for the GIC. They're going through their procurement process right now, and they'll be announcing their rates usually um, uh, beginning of March. They have to go through a whole procurement process. Um, so that will be obviously a significant number in our budget when you consider, uh, you know, the, the, that it re reflects about 10 to 11 percent of the overall budget. So a one percent change one way or the other uh, could have a you know hundred thousand dollar plus impact on on our bottom line net state aid obviously that's something that we know what the governor has proposed and I you know spelled out again the charter school tuition charter school uh, reimbursement conundrum um, but we're hopefully putting House and Senate to be determined um, because we're hopeful that the House and Senate will go back and and really uh, look at Chapter 70 reform and trying to do it in the context of the FY20 uh, budget, as well as hopefully addressing uh, the charter school reimbursement issue as well. Uh, other to be determined is uh, new city and school collective bargaining agreements. Um, both all of our city uh, unions as well as our school unions are finishing, uh, they're in the third year of three year contracts. Uh, so both the city and schools. Uh, Myself representing the city, the school committee representing the school department uh, are uh, in collective or beginning collective bargaining with all of our units. That will obviously uh, determine what wage projections would be for FY20 as well as 21 and 22. But clearly in putting together the 20 budget, having more clarity about uh, what those agreements might look like are keys in how we build the budget. City re retirement assessment, this is a sort of non-negotiable assessment uh, that goes to the retirement board uh, based on uh, the actuarial tables that get adjusted every year. So we know that in FY20, uh, there will be a $475,000 increase in our uh, contribution to pay our retirement, future retirement obligations. Capital debt service, uh, that basically means how much our, our general fund debt service will go up this year, again, to pay for all the capital investments that we've made 
Um, so that'll go up about 87,000. So those are some of the numbers that we're looking at and some of the unknown numbers that over the next several weeks we'll be uh, trying to read the tea leaves, particularly in terms of what happens um, in, on Beacon Hill, uh, to try to determine uh, what those numbers may look like so that we can build a budget uh, and, uh, and present it to the city council. Next uh, slide. So coming back to where we started, the, um, the fiscal stability plan. This is the, 20, this is the current fiscal stability plan that we're operating under. This is what is in the FY 2019 budget book. Um, each year, I promised when we um, presented the plan back in 2013, we would, we would relook at it, we would revise our estimates, um, and we would uh, present an updated plan. Um, so obviously, one of the big question marks in terms of where we are with building an FY20 budget is what does it mean in terms of the current and future viability of the fiscal stability plan. Um, I mentioned earlier that the 2019 budget, um, you can see the first little blue uh, in the middle there where FY 2019 is. That's where we had to use a little under $300,000 of the fiscal stability funds in order to balance last year's 2019 budget. Um, then, uh, just following last year's projections, the way the, the stability plan as we had it projected, um, uh, we would then have to use about 900000 uh, to close the 20 budget, and then in 2021, uh, um, we would basically have to expend the rest of the stability fund, but even then we would have a deficit. Um, so that was sort of the model we were looking at last fiscal year. Obviously, we now have some potential new revenues. Um, we also potentially have changes, uh, some possibly of these structural changes in state funding um, that we can look at. But these are all the things we'll be evaluating <coughs> the next uh, several months in leading up to our need to present um, a balanced budget to the city council uh, for its review and approval. Um, so again, each year we, we adjust these numbers. So uh, more state aid, uh, more, you know, this new local revenue, um, additional Chapter 70, these could all uh, forestall our having to use, um, you know, fiscal stability fund. On the same token, um, a 5% increase in health insurance or a 7% increase in health insurance um, or other factors uh, as we go through the budget process could then, you know, could then put pressure the other way in terms of our needing to spend more uh, money in the budget. So it's a fluid and, uh, and, and moving process, um, but this is what the f stability plan looks like. I have in red at the bottom my annual disclaimer, um, and from the first moment I presented the plan to, and every subsequent budget year, I've always been very clear that when the stability plan is exhausted, we'll be back to the question of do we uh, do another general operating override uh, to sort of renew the stability plan, um, or uh, do we make significant cuts in city and school services um, to balance future budgets? Um, so I've tried to be upfront. This was always intended to be um, a bridge uh, in terms of buying us stability over several years. Um, but we knew that, again, that, that differential in terms of rising costs uh, that go up uh, on a regular basis, some of them fixed costs, um, and the inability to, to generate enough revenue to meet those and not receiving enough of our state tax dollars back uh, to be able to meet those is basically the structural imbalance that we face and that other cities and towns across the Commonwealth face. So. Uh, that is the last slide. I now have the obligatory questions slide, which I will ask you to put up. Oh, actually, let's do the budget timeline first. Um, so this is just the quick timeline. Um, tonight I present the joint meeting of the City Council and School Committee to just give you a preliminary forecast. Um, the two school committees, the Northampton Public Schools and Smith Voke, um, are required to adopt their budgets by uh, April 16th and present them to me. Um, so the school committee, uh, the Northampton School Committee and uh, the Smith Voke Board of Trustees will be beginning uh, their budget processes, meeting with their departments and, and staffs to develop that, and then eventually bring bringing them to the school committee um, and board of trustees um, for, for uh, review and deliberation and, and hopefully final votes. Um, 
then uh, traditionally in April, after the school budget have been adopted, I typically have town hall budget meetings around the city to meet with residents and to try to get um, their feedback. Um, I am then required uh, by the middle of May to submit my uh, balanced uh, 2020 budget to the city council. Um, and then they have a deadline, obviously, of June 30th uh, to have held a public hearing um, and to vote uh, to um, approve um, the budget uh, in time for the start of the fiscal year on July 1st, 2020. So. Um, now we can go to the um, obligatory uh, question slide, uh, which I have jazzed up a little bit um, in honor of uh, in honor of the Super Bowl, um, I, because the Patriots are playing this weekend. So I thought I'd have a little fun with that. So you can turn the lights on, and we can now um, move to questions, if you have any. It's a shorter presentation. I didn't say it would be easier to, to swallow or easier to deal with. I don't know if you're accepting quite, uh, Fred has his hand up, but I don't know if you're accepting questions from the audience. I'm not really sure um, our, under our rules whether we are allowed to do that um, unless someone wanted to vote to recognize a person, but I don't know. Um, I'm certainly happy to field a question, but that would not be the normal protocol in this meeting unless there was a vote to recognize someone. But I can certainly answer his question after the meeting. I'd be happy to. So since I grabbed the floor, <laughs> so, and less of a question, more of a comment, and it's one that I think annually, I think, is um, <clears throat> we are actually on track to abide by the system that was set up under Proposition 2.5. And, and Proposition 2.5, of course, is often reflected. Every, it's often suggested that every community that goes and asks for an override is, is a, an admission of failure. But when in fact, it's called two and a half for a reason. It wasn't, it wasn't some chapter line. It's called two and a half percent because it was meant to run below COLAs, the rate of inflation. It was, it was meant to force each community every time to go and solicit from the community, each municipal, municipal uh, governance to go before their community and say, do you want to continue to subsidize what we have? And, and I have to say it's worth noting that with your fiscal stability plan and the, last, and the, and the uh, basis for the last override that the community did invest in, it, you've done a remarkable job. You have actually, and with, with some corresponding luck, fortunately, uh, uh, to be noted, we're limited as to how much more growth we can actually have by physical constraints, among other things. Um, the marijuana revenue, as you said, is a crapshoot. Uh, we continually hope for progressive taxation based on people's ability to pay, based on, as opposed to the regressive taxation, which is based on how much someone values your house. And it also, as you said, the biggest pressure, of course, it puts on people on fixed incomes in, in, in pretty dire straits because they're now, <coughs> their mortgages are long since paid down, but now they're paying a property tax bill that's equivalent to the mortgages they paid all throughout their lives. So essentially this is a state, intentionally state structured system that the, the state, the Commonwealth voted on and approved and then we have the added um, trauma basically induced by the state of, of doing things like not a, a, a dysfunctional uh, education funding formula, and then you add to that the charter school, uh, the, their obligations and commitment to the charter school funding, uh, which is tantamount to theft. I don't, I don't think. I mean, I, I mean that's a strong word, but I mean I honestly don't see. If, if I did that to an individual, I think that they could say that I was stealing money from them. So, so. <clears throat> the you have, I think you very well presented. The, uh, the budget, the constraints, the challenges that we're going to be facing, and um, and of course it all comes to a head this year, particularly along with all sorts of things like collective bargaining, also the, uh, paying the, the additional increases that we're going to continue to see as our uh, retirement commitments are going to increase. So, uh, so I'm grateful for the presentation. I'm not really happy as per usual with the message, but. That's not 
your fault. So I'll, I won't. Just the messenger. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and thereby, you will not be shot. Tonight. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Voss and then Just Calvin. following up, um, I agree. It's really an impressive way that the override has been put to work to save money and to build up reserves. And I think that shows really good planning. My question is, um, how much growth do you anticipate in the coming few years? We had more growth during that period than had been anticipated. It's been, we've been able to grow, as you shared. But when does that come to an end? And that is the challenge because, um, you know, those key, those things that we, we made estimates about, you know, are tied to the economy. And so, you know, we were coming out of a worldwide recession and so people weren't lending money and people weren't buying and then, and then they started, you know, again, building again. Uh, and so, um, so we try to be conservative and, and come up with what our new growth estimates are, but I, I can't predict whether, I mean, we certainly have new building systems that we know are gonna continue to come online. There's still some additional um, housing um, development that's planned and permitted at uh, Village Hill. Um, we've got things like the uh, marijuana cultivation facility, which is a major facility. So we seem to always have new projects in the pipeline. Um, and so, you know, again, we try to um, make make responsible estimates. So I, I try to be, you know, sort of bullish and optimistic, um, but it's, in many ways it's beyond our control because it's really tied to the economy. Why people are buying new cars, I, I can't tell you. Maybe interest rates are low, maybe whatever, but clearly there was a surge in, you know, excise tax because people were buying newer cars. Uh, maybe it was energy rebates or maybe it was, you know, safer, lower gas mileage. Um, I, I don't know, but those are the kinds of things that are, they're cyclical and obviously we keep hearing that there's going to be another recession and, you know, the stock market's been a little, a little shaky, but, um, but yeah, th that's the, that's part of the crystal ball that we have to try to try to deal with. And that's part of the reason why you have stabilization funds because, you know, part of the reason why our, our reserves were so low in FY12 is because basically when the crash happened in 09 and 010, we were using our reserves to be to prop up city government. So that's why you have them. Uh, Councilor LaBarge and then Councilor Murphy. Mayor, I want to thank you and also thank Susan Wright um, for this great presentation. Um, also to Susan, I had the same concerns as you had. Um, Mayor, why is it every year everybody's very, very vocal about the budget itself? I mean, we need that increase and we don't get it. It's like deaf ears with them in Boston. So you're looking at how many years now, over 18 years, we've been asking for them to increase that budget and nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, again, um, I, Super Dr. Provost and I testified at the Foundation Budget Review Commission back in like 2014, I think it was, and uh, so that report was issued then, and uh, Governor Baker got elected, and there was that report presented to him, and um, and the first thing he did was propose expanding charter schools, um, and so there have been strong advocates fighting to try to get that report, which was a bipartisan report that pretty much laid it right out there, um, to try to get that uh, report looked at. Um, there's been a push, part of the fair share amendment was a way to try to provide the revenue to be able to fund uh, the foundation <coughs> reforms, but obviously that failed. Um, but there's definitely strong voices. We've definitely elected um, strong uh, representation here in Northampton with you know Representative Sabadosa and Senator Comerford, um, as well as uh, legislators throughout the valley. And I think we're just gonna have to um, continue to put pressure on them that you know they need to address these critical uh, reforms because right. we have schools that are you know more, that are facing receivership in some cases because of the fact that they you know they cannot afford uh, the costs of um, of educating their children. Um, so you know that's the question, and I think at, at the end of the day, um, it, it is ultimately I think it's a re it's a revenue question, um, and so and so that's just going to be. Uh, what we have to try to keep pressure on them uh, to try to address. Councilor Murphy. And, and new growth, um, you've got to be careful with relying on that to actually help your bottom line. It depends on what that new growth is. 
you know, if that new growth is a commercial property, it actually helps the bottom line. If that new growth is a residential property that results in your enrollment going up, then it has to be a six or seven hundred thousand dollar residential property just to cover the education costs of one child in school. Mm -hmm. So to have a big new growth number doesn't actually always help the bottom line if that property increases the cost more than it generates income. Um, so a big new growth number, if it's residential, could put you further behind the eight ball because of the services that we provide to residential properties that we don't necessarily apply to commercial properties. So, you know, it really does it really does come around to the fact that, you know, to the bottom line, do what we did with a fiscal stability plan. It's going to take the voters to want to continue to invest in the city. And I mean, it's helpful to make the case with the fact that, you know, rather than getting four years out of it, we're getting close to eight years out of it. Um, and we have run, you know, this group knows how tight a budget we run on both sides. But at the same time, if, if we want to be able to do it again, we're going to have to talk the, the voters into giving us another shot at keeping it going because we are going to add new collective bargaining and health care costs and everything else. So it's unrealistic to think there's pretty much any other way to solve it and certainly, certainly not new growth. It takes the sting out, um, but it, it's not going to solve the problem. Councillor Shiera. Um, our retirement obligation is a significant increase, cost increase. Can you talk a little bit more about that and um, what the future holds and just sort of the realities of those increasing costs? If you wouldn't mind, I have a member of the retirement board <laughs> who's here. Um, and I think if Ms. Susan Wright, who's our finance director and also serves as my appointee on the retirement board, um, she can explain to you the actuarial issues regarding that. So the we're under obligation across the state, all of the retirement systems, to get to full funding by 2040. So what that means is that the employees, the contributions they make to their, their retirement will fully support the system. So back in the 70s and 80s when they found that these retirement systems were not uh, solvent if they kept going the way they were, they obligated all of the um, member communities and, and counties to get to full funding. So we are kicking in about five or six million a year to our, retire, to our retirees' retirement. When we reach full funding, we don't have to pay that anymore. But we won't reach that. At the moment, um, we are on track to be fully funded, I think, 2035. Um, but every two years, we have an actuarial valuation, and that recalibrates our glide path and they take into account um, the retirement board uh, voted uh, new mortality tables because people are living longer so it's you know they're going to draw their retirement for a longer period of time um, salaries are going up as well um, so that moving that target gets recalibrated every two years so we just had an actuarial evaluation um, the other thing that happened is we had to lower our expectations for um, investments. We had been using 7.75 several years ago. Um, it's been recommended that we <coughs> move down to 6.5. So every time we plan that people are going to live longer or we plan that our returns are going to be lower, the city, to keep on that glide path to fully fund by 2040, has to kick in more. So this last actuarial valuation, we dropped our discount rate from 7.5 to 7.375. So we're, every two years, we're kind of moving that down. So we are making very um, small adjustments, um, keeping in mind what the city can afford, but also trying to keep that retirement plan on track. Because when we finish paying for, when we get to 2040 and we get to full funding, we're going to take all of that money that we've been putting into the retirement system and we're going to move it over to start paying for our um, OPEB, which is the health insurance for our retirees, which is our other big unfunded liability. So, so when we, we look forward to 2040, is what you're right. When we get to 2040, you know, we'll probably be at like eight or 10 million into the retirement system and all of that will go over to OPEB and it'll make a huge, huge um, dent in that as well. But we're Jesus never really going to. Loosely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's never really going. We're, it's going to be a long, long. But that's why it does. That's why it took such a big jump this year because we lowered the investment. Could I just, uh, while I have you here, just because I want the public to understand the full picture, 
the average retirement pension in our system? The average retirement pension last time I checked was about twenty five thousand, between twenty five and twenty seven thousand a year. A year. So just want to you know just want to be clear that these are not you know golden parachutes that were you know these are most many in many cases they're you know DPW workers who retire after forty years they're laborers custodians mm -hmm. etc. So just that's why I think that information is important when people hear about these pension obligations. So. Well, and, and it should be noted too that employees are contributing to this. Um, employees are contributing, new employees are co contributing 9%, and if they earn over 40000 they're contributing 11% of their pay. So they are contributing quite a bit. So. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> um, can you explain to us a little bit more about the, the reserve funds? I know it's hard for a lot of people uh, that have asked me questions to understand I understand, we all understand that the bond rating improved when we had more money in reserves and then we went from 200 some thousand to, what are we at, 12 million now? Uh, I have to look at the total. I don't, yeah, it's, totally it, but, but I guess people, people kind of say like, what's the end game? That number keeps going up. When are we done building that reserve? At what point is the cutoff where the bond rating would go down if we dipped into the reserve? Like, do we have any fund, fund room with that? So typically, the first thing is we, um, we, are, we are utilizing, we, first of all, we have, um, we have uh, policies for how we treat our various um, uh, funds and how we build them up and how we draw down. So for the capital stabilization, um, we have a whole metric built in so that we do draw, when they reach a certain level as a percentage of the budget, we actually are drawing them down uh, to pay for capital costs, to pay for you know various capital projects for city and schools. The, um, the other stabilization fund, uh, the, just the general stabilization fund, um, we, we again uh, try to maintain that at a level for when we have emergencies, when we have a big snow year where we didn't budget enough and we need to we may need to dip into that a few years ago we had we had those huge snow loads and we had to pay people to like hand shovel snow off the roofs because the city engineer and the city building commissioner was worried about them collapsing um, so we had to go into emergency funds so um, we ha we try to maintain as a percentage of our overall budget I can't cite the percentages but I can get those to you um, but there is a method to our madness and um, and we do again we're we're not trying to build them up ad infinitum. We try to look at you know things like our, our undesignated fund balance, which is the free cash balance. Um, DOR uh, recommends, and the bond uh, rating agencies look at uh, you know somewhere between five to ten percent of your operating budget that you're generating, that then you can use for capital projects and such. So um, we do have metrics, and again, we're typically what we're putting into those funds are at the end of the fiscal year when we have um, monies that get turned back to us. So there's unused salary or there's unused, uh, we don't spend uh, money on a maintenance project or as much money as we thought we were. That comes back to us. Typically what we do with that, uh, the, what's called free cash or undesignated fund balance is we apportion a large chunk of it to the capital program. So we use that to fund the capital program. Um, and then our practice has been um, to then put a portion of that, we usually go to the city council and to put a, a portion of it anywhere between 250 to 500,000 into those stabilization funds because they're one-time monies. Um, so we can't, we don't really want to spend them on operating expenses. So um, it's usually anything that we have left over after we've invested in capital projects or snow and ice <coughs> or having to pay for um, unanticipated veterans benefits or, or legal funds, things like that, um, that we would then put the money away. But I can, I can follow up with you and get you more information. Um, but again, keep in mind, um, you know, when you're borrowing, you know, twenty million dollars, and if you get a, you know, a two percent interest rate versus a five percent interest rate, then that's going to have a major impact on what you have to pay out of the general fund every year to service that debt. Um, so when we're paving roads or we're, you know, doing the matching funds for the MSBA school roofs, you know, we did a couple for NPS. We're about to do one for Smith Vogue. Um, it's it's more than just like yeah we've got this fancy number this AAA number it means lower borrowing costs which means lower operating costs so it is important but when you sit down with the um, 
when we will now sit down virtually, we have a conference call with the bond raters. You know, they want it. They're looking at our audited statements every year, and they're looking um, where are those reserve funds? Are they starting to go south? Are you starting to res rely on them to fund your budget? Um, are you paying off your retirement obligation? Is your retirement system fully funded? What is your OPEB? That's another big one now that the, it's called other than post employee benefits. So it's the, all the other stuff beyond retirement, which is basically health insurance. Um, our retirees are gonna get health insurance, right? We fund it as a pay as you go and everybody's getting their health insurance, but um, accounting practices now want you to show that as a future liability. And so they want you to have a fund almost like the retirement system fund where you're putting aside money to pay for that future liability. Um, and again, the bond raters view that as part of the full faith and credit of, of this corporation that there's that liability hanging out there. So, so that's the other reason why the bond rating issue is so important. So, yes, Ms. Burnham. Um, could you talk about um, the health insurance costs are clearly a big um, chunk too. And um, I'm curious how if the Chapter 70 funding, health insurance is, is keeps being discussed in the Chapter 70 funding, when they say, like, if we were fully funded and health insurance is kind of put into that, how does that affect a city when Chapter 70 is linked to the school, to schools, like, how would that affect the overall GIC and everything? Well, Chapter 70 is, uh, well, health insurance, in, at least in the city, is an indirect cost that the city pays. So we right. pay for all of the... Um, all of the school health insurance, but it does show up on the um, the final audited statement for the schools in terms of what our contribution. It's just it's just in kind, not direct money. Um, so to the extent that, and again, you know, the, I don't have the chart this year, but I mean, health insurance costs. Yeah. You saw the little graph; um, those are going up. And any of you who have, you know, um, you know, spouses who work in a private industry, you know, health insurance costs are, are going up even at a at a greater rate. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that the foundation formula, uh, you know didn't account for was, you know, was looking at 1980s where health insurance was still relatively cheap and it wasn't going up like that. Um, and so the cost of educating a child, they weren't factoring in the inflation in health insurance. They also weren't factoring in um, how much we're spending today on special education and, and ELL and all the other uh, supports that we are increasingly are providing. So. Um, so to the extent they recognize those costs and, and in the overall cost of educating a child, then the funding and the formula, the city's obligation, the state's obligation, you know, need to reflect that. And so that's where that additional funding would come from. Um, although there are concerns about, you know, the governor wants to fund it over like seven years um, and that will just not work. Um, we'll, that will we'll just never get above uh, our heads above water that scenario he's kind of kicking the can down the road in my in my opinion um, so so that's the issue did I did I so it's bundled it, it would just be bundled up when they talk about health insurance in the in fully in the foundation budget yeah it's just okay yeah I mean there is tech I mean they're looking at the costs of running a school district right. um, and, and the cost of educating child what it costs per pupil to do that and one of the big factors is paying employees but also providing health insurance benefits for employees and you know, special ed and, and health insurance have been going like this, and the formula never didn't account for that. <coughs> so really, the what what it, the foundation budget um, really isn't. An, I mean, schools that just fund their budgets at foundation are you know they're they're in trouble typically. Um, and uh, you know, we're uh, over 120 percent of foundation, and we feel like we're in trouble every year. Um, and you know, other school much wealthier districts are are funding at a much higher level. Um, so therein lies the rub. Mr. Kaufman. Yes, thank you for your great presentation. I appreciate it. So I have three quick questions. So you mentioned uh, stabilization fund and reserve funding, and we didn't talk rainy day funds. Are these all one and the same? Yeah, rainy day fund is just another terminology for a stabilization fund. Okay. Um, you know, like the like on the school side, you have the school choice fund. You right. know, school choice funds, which is sort of the school committees and school departments rainy day fund. And That's it's sort of the, so it's, it's it, it gets different terminologies get used, but basically 
it's a fund that that um, that gets set aside. It's outside of the um, right. the turnover every year in the operating budget, and it requires a higher threshold of votes by the city council to take money out of it. It requires right. they're more or less those three are more or less the same. Yes, okay. they are. Just they're categorized for different purposes. Okay. And then secondly, can you clarify for the uh, marijuana tax? Does the city get three percent or six percent? So the city gets as a tax as a as a income tax or sales tax, we get 3% on the sale. Um, then we are allowed to negotiate uh, a host community agreement um, for a for a five year period only of a mitigation, uh, mitigation funds. Um, and that can be up to 3%. Um, and those, um, there's you may have read there's some uh, contra controversy. It's not controversial for me, but it's controversial for some um, in the industry and and some on the commission um, about the um, about those uh, those host community agreements and the funds and how the and how the funds will be used for mitigation. At this point, we've negotiated a three percent host community agreement. So um, those are funds that would be paid to us to be used. Uh, to mitigate impacts of uh, of marijuana, um, but again, it's not a recurring revenue, but, but beyond five years, it it goes away after five years. Okay, and then the other three percent will go into the general fund, and it must use... go into the general fund, and we will again. That's just additional revenue in the general fund that we will allocate towards all the things we've been talking about tonight. Right, and then okay, thank you. And then lastly, real quick, so uh, U.S. Rep. Richard Neal, I believe, is chair of the Federal Ways and Means Committee yes. now. Do you see any opportunities there in terms of um, speaking with his office? Is that something our local legislators should do, or that you and Dr. Provo should do, or can we, as city council and school committee members, get involved in in trying to um, sway his thinking and and his uh, support that he, you know, sway his support in in manners that are important to us? Yeah, I mean, I mean, clearly there are critical, um, you know, federal grant programs that oftentimes come under attack. Um, things like Title I and, and other important, you know, funding that often come under attack. And obviously, he's the head of the tax writing committee, so any he's the revenue guy. Um, so any time a budget is developed, so I think there's things like that. Um, there's things like there are often threats uh, to um, taking away. The um, uh, you know municipal bonds are tax exempt. There have been various proposals floated to take away the tax exemption for municipal bonds, which would be uh, not a good thing uh, for municipalities. And and um, and I know he's been very outspoken on that. Um, and then obviously there's this massive wealth transfer that we all just uh, were subjected to under the um, <coughs> tax plan, uh, which we're seeing. Uh, we're, we're still finding out some of the impacts of that, and uh, and I think that's certainly something that he's going to that we hope that he's going to prioritize to try to reverse. And that's everything from you know deductibility of charitable donations, um, state and local income tax deductibility, um, which doesn't affect us, but it has uh, it does affect many uh, states and many communities, which is basically a local tax increase where you're being double taxed on your, I mean, the theory always was that you, you know, you wouldn't tax people on the tax they paid at the local level because it would be a double tax. So they've now capped that. Um, so there are communities in Massachusetts and states where that double taxation is occurring, which again, it's going to make it hard to then go to those people and say, could you give more local taxes for the school? So sure. I think those right. are some big systemic things that he could work on. Um, and so, you know, those would be things we would want to be lobbying him. This, of course, assumes that there'll be an actual rational budget process where we'll be considering a full fiscal year budget, which really hasn't happened. Um, it, we, we seem to be living on three-month extensions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, yeah, but he certainly is in, an, in a place to influence that and in, in a place to influence possible, you know, new, new revenue, which could then increase you know, uh, formula funding for education and other programs. For sure, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Hennessy and then Councilor Klein. Two quick ones. One, um, the impact on MGM. Do you see any impact? Yeah, I mean, we, we're uh, speaking of that sort of staggered effect of the way those local taxes get collected, because, you know, they get collected. And so we, we still don't have 
Uh, we're still waiting for the, the, the months that where you know, MGM opened in terms of our meals tax and our, I mean, actually the last quarter that we have data for, um, our meals tax were up like over 3%, I think, for, oh, hotel motel taxes were up 3% for that quarter over last year's quarter. Um, you know, we certainly seem to have had a lot of out-of-state visitors lately, um, uh, and I don't think they're here to gamble. Um, and so, um, uh, I actually, there was a story about uh, MGM helpfully providing a shuttle from Northampton to MGM, and I was going to helpfully provide a shuttle from MGM to NETA um, uh, to sort of counter that. But um, a joint agreement. So exactly. <laughs> um, at least a two-way shuttle. Um, so we will be waiting to see. I mean, we, we obviously have concerns about what the impacts could be on our motels, hotels, on our restaurants. Entertainment's a big concern that I have. Yeah. Um, we have seen anecdotally um, some shows that used to happen in Northampton that shifted to MGM. Um, and you know, we did get mitigation funding from the, from the Gaming Commission and we have engaged a uh, firm that's helping us put together a marketing, uh, a way to sort of market Northampton to try to make sure that we capture uh, visitors to Springfield. Um, but I also will say that the numbers that I've seen and that experts have looked at for the casino have actually been coming in under projections. They haven't been performing uh, to the level. There's clearly the honeymoon period, um, but the honeymoon has been much shorter and the revenues haven't been um, the same. And I'll tell you, I've, I've met with MGM officials and they've said that you know they're still trying to figure out the sort of Western Mass or you know <coughs> New England gaming patron. Um, because the things that they d are doing that they may do in other casinos aren't really working and so they're trying to figure out w what it's going to take. I know they've been you know, raising some of the winning percentages and things like that um, and tweaking that. But So it, it, it remains to be seen but we're trying to be vigilant and we're trying to be proactive. What would you want Chapter 90? He's 200 million now. What would you, what would um, those of us who are... Cities and towns have, for the last several years, um, been, been lobbying for 300 million, yeah. getting it up to 300 million. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we've done, MMA has done surveys of cities and towns. Certainly Northampton could spend another, could spend the money. I mean, it's right now, um, uh, you know the 200 million that gets uh, farmed out on a formula based on the number of road miles. We get about a million, a little over a million dollars. So you know that would be an extra, you know, half a million um, that we would be able to put into more roads and more bridges and more sidewalks and less having to spend less tax dollars. So that one's critical. Um, and again, that's our gas tax that we're paying. Um, and you know. When you look at the actual infrastructure in the state, road infrastructure, you know, we're, we're 80 to 90 percent of it is in cities and towns, yet we get about 10 percent of the gas tax and they get 90 percent. So it's sort of this weird perverse inverse relationship. Now granted, you know, Secretary Pollack will tell you that, you know, they have these huge systems like the Big Dig and huge bridges and the Tobin Bridge, so they do have some large systems. but. Um, but definitely we, the chapter 91, um, and I don't understand it because to me it feels like it's sort of a no, it would be a no brainer at least for the legislature, like that's something ev that would benefit every city and town. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I don't get it because the infrastructure is not going to get any cheaper to fix the more we do. <coughs> so why you wouldn't invest now, I don't understand that. And that tends to be bonded money, the state bonds for the Chapter 90 funding. So, um, but again, uh, I, I don't understand the thinking on that. But we're going to continue to lobby and hopefully they'll raise it. Okay. Councilor Klein. Um, I have two oh. new revenue questions. One uh, very related to the last question. Um, are we imagining with the revenue from the, um, the marijuana tax, are we also looking at or projecting um, an increase in the motel and the meals um, taxes? Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're certainly going to be paying attention to that. We definitely have some signs that, and you may have seen the story in today's Gazette about um, local business owners who commenting on what the impacts have been on, on it and you know it's been mixed some have seen no impact others have definitely seen an uptick in um, in customers um, 
Uh, um, there's a lovely family that owns the liquor store right next to the um, right next to the, the uh, dispensary, and they've definitely seen an increase in uh, business. Um, they were actually kidding with me. They wish they had um, bought a bunch of umbrellas on one weekend because people were standing out in line in the rain. They said they could have made a fortune on umbrellas. But um, but certainly some restaurants have reported that. Um, we'll know better again once we look at our hotel motel numbers for those same periods that we have. Uh, the tax collections, whether we can draw any um, any correlations, but we'll definitely be looking at that. I mean, I think anything that brings visitors to the city um, is gonna is gonna be a benefit for hotels and for uh, you know local option taxes. I think that's the reason, and that's one of the reasons why we want to make sure that we're you know with MGM to the south that we are remaining competitive and that people are still coming to Northampton and coming to concerts here and coming to eat here. So. Uh, the other piece too is uh, pilots. You mentioned we have a, the possibility of pilots with these new solar field projects. Yes. Are there any other? Um, is there anywhere else that you're looking thinking about in terms of pilot um, funding? Well, um, as some of you know, in the FY 2016 budget, I, I um, embarked on a major pilot program uh, for tax-exempt properties uh, in the city, tax-exempt institutions, um, and went through a fairly long public process and, um, and dialogue, and um, at the end of the day uh, was not successful. It was a voluntary uh, program. Uh, was not successful in, in creating any long-term pilot agreements. The solar one is a really unique thing, and it's just because of a quirk um, in the way uh, that the appellate tax board has interpreted um, the definitions around property tax for solar installations. And so, um, and, and so uh, right now, the guidance is that rather than trying to charge them a regular property tax that cities and towns enter into these pilot agreements. The good news is, you know, it means we're going to have a guaranteed new source of revenue for 20 years. Um, but those are really kind of unique situations. So we may have other uh, solar arrays uh, that may come along. I know there's some other folks looking at large arrays, um, but. Um, uh, but uh, but that's sort of a niche uh, kind of a thing. Um, so that's all I can tell you. We've 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 negotiated with pilots with everyone who will negotiate with us, um, from the fairgrounds to uh, to obviously the city properties that we've sold to tax exempt entities. We've we've included pilots, um, um, but in terms of the largest. Uh, tax exempt. Um, it's funny you should ask that because I was looking at some DOR spreadsheets today, as I want to do. And if you look at again the total assessed value and percentage of tax exempt property, 28% um, of our city um, is uh, is tax exempt uh, property. Um, and when you look at how we rank in cities: Worcester, Cambridge, Boston, North Adams, Chelsea, Fitchburg, Northampton. So we're in the top 10 in terms of communities that have tax exempt, large tax exempt properties. North Adams is new. I assume that's Mass Mocha. Um, you know, I'm going from, from commercial to a giant nonprofit. Um, so that is a um, it remains a conundrum. There's legislation to try to address it, but um, I charged that hill once and. Uh, and I'm not really sure what, what, what else I can say about that. And I actually, and I think at the time I said I want to do it during the time of fiscal stability, not wait till there's an emergency, which is when people usually start saying, mm -hmm. why aren't you asking these institutions to pay? So we had a really long, thoughtful process, and at the end of the day, um, it yielded some small voluntary contributions um, for a couple of years, but nothing. <laughs> That are long term, like many institutions negotiate in other in other parts of the state and other parts of the country. So, um, oh, I'll just go down the line, Sh Councilor Shear, Councilor Dwight, Councilor Bidwell. Um, back to those uh, community agreements. After the five years have passed, can't you reapply with the CCC for another five years? Um, it's unclear. The legislation says. Um, and it's really, it's not actually an application process to the CCC, it's the law says that in order to get their first license, you have to negotiate a five-year host community agreement, and, um, but it's limited at five years at this point, the way it reads. It's an open question whether they could be renewed or not. Um, my sense will be that um, there's, um, if the 
if the current host agreements last and stand up to scrutiny um, and last five years, then um, it may be hard to, uh, to get them to renew that. Um, I'm just saying that honestly because it's a, um, I'm not going to say any more. <laughs> lest it be used against me <laughs> in a future proceeding. But, you know, because really what it's supposed to be is to mitigate the impacts. Um, you're supposed to be able to show that this money is mitigating impacts. Um, but, of course, none of us, this is a brand new industry, and we don't, none of us know what those um, things are. And, um, and so, um, so that's, it's a bit of an unknown for all of us. So anyway, that's an open question, and I know there's some threatened. Uh, the Cannabis Commission has asked the legislature for the authority to review host agreements um, to try to police them more, um, but we'll see what happens. So anyway, I'm not making a lot of noise about host com community agreements. Yeah. Stop asking about uh, it. <laughs> stick, sticking with cannabis, the Cannabis Commission kicked down the road another um, potential <coughs> The other leg of the legalization, which was uh, which would be important to uh, tourism, as far as it goes, is the the um, basically pot bars, consumption cafes, yes. yeah. yeah, yeah, and and delivery systems, among other things, <clears throat> and also, I mean, part of the problem, of course, is people who do drive from Tennessee can come and purchase marijuana products but there's no place for them to consume them and they can't bring them back to Tennessee so there does thereby present a bit of a problem whereas if they're if they become a little more accommodating and the state does finally get together to figure out how to do this there's some potential revenues to be realized from that of course there's no way to anticipate what that would be but the fact is there's hope there there's some some promise in that too because that would actually broaden the the breadth of, of uh, taxable entities and also potential future host agreements. Yeah, it would, and, and um, it would also open up the industry to um, to people who may not traditionally have access to the kinds of capital that it takes to to, to be able to start up, build a you know twenty thousand square foot greenhouse, um, <coughs> that kind of a thing. So that's the other like promise. More, it would be promise more small business. Local exactly. Business yeah. As to larger corporate systems. Right now, the Cannabis Commission is working on regulations, but they have uh, the law. The law would need to be changed um, to allow that to happen. Uh, right now, it's an opt-in that would require a ballot question. I know there's people trying to change that, but there's. I've definitely heard from people who are interested. I just think the commission and uh, you know obviously is trying to get the the retail component you know licensed up, um, mm -hmm. and then I think that's probably something they'll be working on along with delivery. So it certainly happens in other states, and, and they've found a way to make it happen. So we'll see what happens. Um, but again, I, it's new revenue, but I do caution people. Um, you know, it's not going to be like chap the kind of money we need in terms of Chapter 70 and foundation budget reform and those kinds of numbers. So it's definitely new revenue, but um, we're not smoking our way out of this problem. <laughs> uh, so. Um, I, I've, oh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I just. I, I, I've, Two slightly separate things, and part of it is to just share some thoughts while the City Council has joined us, if that's okay. Um, I'm not sure it's a question for you, but you might have a response. One is, um, as a school committee member, it really worries me how much time we spend talking about the pot shop. Mm -hmm. I say that because it would be wonderful to have revenue, yes, but it's really, in some sense, also normalizing this for a ver uh, this group of students. and we know it's really bad for their brain development. So I just say that as something that we should all be aware of, and I think we should be aware that it's very important to continue education. I know some of this money is going into that, but probably not enough to do what it needs to do so that our high school, especially our high school students who are smoking pot at a really high rate, if you ask the Prevention Coalition for their numbers, um, realize that there's problems with that. So that's one, just comment. And the other comment I have is, um, Looking at just things related to the school committee, we have had this really great five-ish years of financial stability, and at the same time, I'm very worried about the next period of time, and as Councillor Dwight said at the beginning of this meeting, it's really up to our community to have a conversation to say, do we want to tax ourselves more? And that's really the only option I see that we have 
to continue supporting ourselves at this level. And one thing that we haven't talked about publicly so much is um, our, even though we've been doing okay as a community, we're not paying our teachers very well. They are getting paid at the very bottom of the state. And I just put that out there because as a community member, I'm not okay with that. And I think we need to find money to fix that. And that just adds to the problem. Thanks. Uh, Councilor Bidwell. Um, I, I, I too had a, a marijuana revenue question, but I want to acknowledge that that's a very important point. And uh, the, the public health issues associated with, with marijuana in Northampton, and particularly as it pertains to school kids, is something we do need to keep uppermost in our minds. And anything we can do to get the appropriate amount of dollars to uh, education and trainings, we absolutely need to do. So it's a very, I, 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 I hear you, it's a very important point. But at the very pragmatic level with marijuana revenues, my question is, and then I had just a general observation, but the question is, in the governor's revenue projections, um, do those preliminary projections uh, reflect uh, anticipated state revenues per, uh, coming from the marijuana tax? Definitely has some projections in there that we've looked at. The challenge, of course, is understanding, you know, it doesn't say where the revenues are coming from. And, you know, we were trying to do a little extrapolation already from that. Um, and we're still trying to tease that out. But definitely he's put a revenue number in there, um, like he did with casinos, like right. he's done. But again, um, he, they're making a projection. I don't know what that's based on. Those are some of the things we're going to try to tease out over right. the next few months to see if we can extrapolate from that. But then you have to understand, like, what percentage of the market share did Northampton sales represent to understand, you know, right. how much right. of that revenue we could allocate to ourselves. Um, I think it's been pretty strong in the early going, um, but it, how that will, you know, once right. Boston opens a dispensary, for example, um, you know, Salem just opened one a few weeks ago. There's more in the 617, um, Albany, you know, and other places. I mean, closer to Albany, you've got the Berkshire. So anyway, um, and I will say to uh, Ms. Voss's point, you know, one of the things that's in the host, every host agreement that I've negotiated um, is grant funding for um, uh, a nonprofit organization that works with uh, youth and responsible use, um, like the Prevention Coalition, to be able to try to um, expand and fund their education services around this issue to make sure that there's responsible use. So, but it is an adult use industry, 21 and over, just like, um, and I can tell you that the the you know it's a very it's very strictly enforced, at least what I've seen so far with Netta. Um, so. Other questions? Uh, I, I just sure. follow up with a, a, an observation. Back to the the, the new growth numbers. The, I'd just like to observe that the that $275 million in new growth over a four to five year period, it, it really is an impressive number. And we do need to acknowledge that it is primarily a function of a relatively robust economy during that period of time. But uh, I think we should, as a as a community, pat ourselves on the back a little bit about how very forward-thinking zoning and planning, going back to Mayor Higgins' administration, the, the Sustainable Northampton plan that was adopted at that time, that there's a very good planning department and a very good planning board and very good tweaks to zoning that have resulted, by and large, with the right type of development in the right places. So I think we've done a pretty good job of harnessing uh, the market forces out there uh, to to generate the right kinds of development that, that generate the revenue from that from that new growth, and we certainly can't rely on it on that type of curve going forward. But it is interesting that there are continue to be opportunities that that, that develop, and I'm sure we'll be good at harnessing those and putting them in the right places uh, going forward too. Definitely, Ms. Fallon. This is. Um Probably not relevant. Well, it's definitely not relevant for this budget year, but looking forward. Um, how does, so I know there's been a lot of focus on a complete and accurate count for the 2020 census. How does uh, the census typically affect the federal funding and state funding that come to us? Well, you should ask, because I just had a meeting with the Census Bureau and the Secretary of State to sort of kick off the census program, which is still a, quite a ways off, but they're trying to lay the early groundwork for. Uh, you know, <laughs> ramping up to hire census workers and to uh, begin the count. And it's critical because it's, um, and there's information that they'll be putting out. One of the things they want 
community leaders to do is to really emphasize how important this is in terms of, you know, our congressional apportionment, you know, how many con congressional seats we have. If you lose population, you use congressional seats um, a lot. And then, then that trickles down to the state legislative districts and then ultimately it comes down to the local level when we redraw our wards and and figure out our, our representation here um, but then many of the formulas for funding are per capita based so um, it has a critical impact on on how much federal funding we get and so that was one of the that was one of the big takeaways is as we ramp up and again it's not really going to start till you know it doesn't start until 2020 um, but, uh, but one of the things is trying to get local leaders to impress upon how important it is for their residents in their community to, to, to take the census. Um, and obviously there's a lot of challenges going on right now because of um, uh, you know, the current administration and there's some litigation about what kinds of questions are and aren't gonna be on the census and those are making their way through the courts. Um, but obviously people, there may be some who would have an interest in suppressing uh, you know the census count, uh, particularly in in among certain populations and among um, and maybe in certain states. Uh, and so, because again, that means you know one less seat here means another seat in Texas or some other um, some other uh, less blue state. So so it's critical, and that's going to be something coming up over the next. Uh, well, again, <coughs> launching in um, early 2020. Um, and then continuing on uh, into the, in, through the summer of 2020. And then the count happens, and then the census gets tabulated, then it gets released, and then usually those 2022 elections would be with new draw, newly drawn, redrawn congressional maps and state uh, maps as well. So it's critical. Yeah, especially Western Mass, because we've lost, I mean, Massachusetts has lost congressional seats, and by virtue of our population, that means we tend to lose uh, congressional seats as well. So it's critical. Okay, any other um, questions? Okay, um, well, thank you all for being here tonight, and obviously we'll be moving forward, you know, meeting with departments and um, getting make the formulations that we need. If you have other questions, let us know. Ms. Sorry, Fox. I have one. So how do we think about moving forward in terms of who should, how does an override get proposed and who decides if that's an appropriate community conversation to start having and yeah. what is the time frame for that? Um, well, again, uh, typically <coughs> it's a conversation that's uh, generally proposed um, usually by the mayor in the context of a, of a budget process. Um, and, and until I know what the numbers are right now, um, you also have to understand that we have 2.6 million sitting in a fiscal stability fund uh, that we've built up. Um, so that, which again, we've had to touch the first 300,000 of it, but we've got 2.6 million dollars in revenue that are built up. And the way the plan was constructed is that we would start to draw down on that. Um, and then eventually, now obviously the timing of it is important. Um, I don't think we'd want to go to zero in the fund, um, but that is going to be a timing question. Um, at this point, it's not something that I'm uh, talking about because, again, there's so many uncertainties in terms of what the revenue is going to look like, um, and I'd need to know more. When I proposed the one in 2015, um, it happened in about April or May of that year once we had a clearer understanding of some of the revenue issues. Um, that's typically the way the process would, would unfold. Yeah. Because it's, I mean, only the mayor and city council can put a ballot question, can put a referendum question before the voters. Um, so that's typically the way the process works. The mayor proposes, the city council typically approves. Um, or I'm, I'm saying they would approve. You put the acts on it. Uh, but anyway, that's typically been the process. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you all again. And again, uh, go Patriots. Thank you. Uh, no.